I've been spending a fair amount of time lately interviewing companies that are involved in some aspect of hydrogen product or the hydrogen economy, whether it's production or what's on the demand side. And I want to see what, you know, the people who are involved in developing it, who are putting their capital where their mouth is, what they think about the future of hydrogen technology. And so I'm going to interview Mark Fiesel, who is the executive vice president and chief commercial officer of Fuel Cell Energy. They're a global leader in green hydrogen production, that's electrolyzers. And the company's based in the U.S., but it has a manufacturing facility in Calgary. So welcome to the interview, Mark. Thank you, Mark. I'm happy to be here. Now, first, of, let's start with your technology first. Give us a kind of a broad overview of, how, of electrolyzers and where your technology is at, what makes it different. Absolutely. So we have been developing um, what's called solid oxide electrolysis for almost 20 years now. Um, our center of competency for that is in Calgary, Alberta. So it is the place that we've been developing this technology um, what makes this technology unique is that it operates at extremely high efficiencies. So if waste heat is available to our electrolyzer, we can convert that to hydrogen with 100% electrical efficiency. Without waste heat, it, it will convert that uh, electricity to hydrogen at 92% efficient. And what really matters there, Markham, is when you talk about green energy, when you think about you know, the space it takes for green energy, um, and the cost associated with it, getting the most efficiency that you can out of the electrolysis pro um, process is key. Uh, for example, um, you know, the capacity factor for most solar plants is somewhere between 25, 28%. So you're already losing a lot of the, you know, efficiency out of the entire, you know, generation plant just because of the fact that the sun doesn't shine every day. Um, the typical electrolysis that is in the market today, alkaline-based technologies, is closer to 65 to 70 percent efficient. So you've already taken, you know, 25 percent capacity factor, and now you're losing another 35 percent in the transition to hydrogen. So making the most of that green energy, solid oxide will be very good at that. Now, does your what at what price does your electrolyzer produce hydrogen? So we've I hear six dollars a kilogram is kind of the average for green hydrogen. Is that where are you at with that? Yeah, it's pretty typical in that range. As we ramp up, that that price will be able to drop. And of course, as subsidy becomes available in different markets, as it is, we know that the kind of moonshot goal is is a dollar per, per kilogram. We believe. Let me let me answer it this way. We believe that at scale, the capital cost associated with solid oxide electrolysis will match the legacy technologies out there today. So you'll have the same cost point and much more efficiency. Therefore the lowest levelized cost of hydrogen in the market. Are electrolyzers, and I guess your electrolyzer technology, is it on a learning curve? Are we going to see the same kind of decline in costs that we've seen with wind, solar, and batteries? That's exactly correct. That's right. So, uh, you know, as this technology is coming to market, um, as we begin to scale manufacturing associated with this, this was absolutely going to drive down costs. Of course, we developed our own models around what that looks like, uh, but this is kind of fundamental to the market assumption. Now, as a Canadian journalist, I'm I'm and as someone who lived in Calgary and does a lot of reporting on Calgary, what why is your manufacturing plant located in Calgary? And I ask that because very often what happens is technology is developed in Canada and then uh, sold or moved down to the U.S., uh, you know, because it can scale more efficiently there. Absolutely. So fuel cell energy had been developing electrolyzer, I'm sorry, uh, molten carbonate fuel cell technology since 1969. So that is a variant of this idea of, of a, uh, you know, a solution that through an electrochemical process creates electricity and threat in, instead of combustion. Um, it turns out that that in addition to molten carbonate fuel cell stack technology, there is technology that's called solid oxide. Um, we identified uh, a company in Calgary uh, a long time ago that had been studying that technology. These are deeply scientific issues, heavy R&D. Um, so we acquired that company. Um, when you've got the right kind of people that are working on that, high, highly disciplined, very specific um, we knew this was a place that we could go and grow upon that base in Calgary. So, in fact, you know, between now and 2025, 
um, we are going to improve our capacity at that facility tenfold. Well, that's very interesting because I know the Alberta government is is a big push on attracting tech companies to Calgary, and te Calgary is becoming a bit of a clean energy tech hub. Is that your perception of it? And do you think the talent pool will be there to support your expansion? I do believe the talent pool is going to be in Calgary to support that kind of expansion. So there's a number of high tech industries. And I agree that Canada has actually led the way in many different um, facets of energy transition, all the way back from power management, digitalization. Uh, you know, th there's a long track record of Canadian companies um, really successfully driving energy transition. We believe this is a continuation of that. Well, tell me about your marketing plans. You just signed a, a big MOU in uh, Malaysia that looks like uh, you'll be building your uh, electrolyzers and deploying them all around Asia. Uh, tell us about the MOU. Yeah, what that's really about is as you think about the story of where energy is at right now around the world, there's still a billion people without access to energy. There's um, roughly a 1.5 billion with access to only intermittent energy. Um, but at the same time, we've got many, many more people coming onto the grid. So I read a statistic the other day that said um, between now and 2050, half of the people born in this world will be born in Africa, right? And a, a country that is developing and will require energy to go fuel that growth. So we've got to figure out how to get energy. At the same time, we've got some energy security concerns, right? So Europe right now is trying to think about what does a world look like when Potentially, they're buying less fossil fuels from, from Russia. Um, and you've got countries such as Korea, Japan, Taiwan, et cetera, that don't have a lot of natural resources. Hydrogen prevents a mechanism by which energy um, can be moved into those zones. It's going to require large-scale hydrogen production. Um, and especially as we think about the story of green hydrogen, it's going to require ultra efficient electrolyzers. So we knew that we needed someone that could help us build these plants at scale. We're not talking about one megawatt. We're not talking about 10 megawatts. We're talking about hundreds of megawatts, if not gigawatts of electrolysis. So this is, you know, this is massive scale in Malaysia, marine and heavy industry. You see a company with deep competence in building large industrial things. They build some of the largest offshore oil rigs in the world right now. They do a lot in the shipping industry. They understand how to build ports. They understand how to build big infrastructure. The story of hydrogen is going to be making it in one part of the world. So, for example, places where the sun shines a lot or the wind blows a lot with access to water. So that's places like Chile. That's like United Arab Emirates. That can be Australia other places around the world and getting it to those places, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, et cetera, and Europe. Um, it's, and, and so you've got a transportation store that goes in there. So MMHE, we think, was an ideal uh, partner with us to, to marry best-in-class electrolysis technology to someone that can build and construct at scale and has deep competence in the world of transportation. Now, Mark, maybe you can answer a question that's been nagging me for a long time, and that's the feasibility of moving large scale, uh, large amounts of hydrogen over long distances, whether it's by pipeline or ship. Yep. And that seems to me, given the nature of hydrogen, to be fairly inefficient. And and it see now it makes sense to me that if you're going to refuel, say, uh, uh, logging trucks, uh, there's a, a pilot project going into British Columbia. Uh, yep in short order to do that you put the electrolyzer where the trucks are going to fuel up and and you don't have to transport it uh very far at all uh, but it sounds like you're talking about the hydrogen being shipped over long distances is that feasible uh is it economic uh give us your take on it well, you've, you've hit on one of the big challenges that the industry is working upon, and I think you're going to see multiple approaches to this. You mentioned two of them already, right? So there is one scenario where you can develop hydrogen at scale at a place like Tunisia, and there happens to be a pipeline between Tunisia and Italy today. And so being able to go that, that right now, that pipeline, by the way, is designed to run the other direction. You know, natural gas comes down from from Russia flows through Europe and ends up down, down in Africa. Imagine turning that around and pushing hydrogen up in that direction. So there's a story that it's a pipeline-based story. Some of that will be hydrogen pipelines, and some of that will be in the form of kind of fortifying natural gas. So 
many uh, parts of the natural gas ecosystem today will be able to operate with hydrogen as a component of the natural gas. So we're not going to have to go to people and say, hey, get rid of your natural gas, whatever it is, burner or engine, you know, put something that does hydrogen in. It's going to be big capital infrastructure. Instead, we can fortify that natural gas with a certain percentage, and it varies depending on what it is, of hydrogen and naturally decarbonize. So you're going to see some solutions like that. The second kind of solution you alluded to as well, and that's this the shipment challenge. How are we going to get from here there? What's it going to look like? Well, there's some precedents in the world of LNG, right? Someone you could have made the same arguments about LNG. Is it really possible to take and get hydrogen? I'm sorry, natural gas from here to there. Does it really make sense? That industry is an established industry now, well understood and moving. So one of the things that we think about is can we leverage some of the best practices? What do people know how to go move now? What is the infrastructure in place to go do that? So one of the things that people are landing on is the idea of ammonia, right? So NH3, um, essentially ammonia can become a hydrogen carrier. There are many people around the world that know how to make ammonia, Haber-Bosch process, et cetera, transport ammonia, use ammonia, either for fertilizer, or unpack it back into molecules. This is, this is a way that we think is, is likely going to be one of the different carriers associated with it. But there's also companies that are actually inventing their own molecules uh, that, uh, that, that might be easier to pack and unpack, et cetera. So there's going to be a lot of innovation in that space today. There is a third thing, though, and I think the third thing is, is quite interesting as well. You may have seen that we announced uh, a, um, a, a project in Ukraine that will involve small modular nuclear with um, with with our solid oxide electrolysis. That's a particularly good use case because nuclear has waste heat available. And as I mentioned earlier on, the solid oxide electrolyzer will operate 100% efficiency with waste heat. So marrying together small modular nuclear plus, plus solid oxide electrolysis will deliver ultra efficient um, hydrogen into markets today that could be used for power or simply for fertilizer, et cetera. So we see that model um, being proliferated as well. There's probably another model yet that also involves nuclear. And that could be, you've got nuclear power plants um, around the world. Uh, and in some cases, those nuclear power plants are worried about a future in which they're not going to be able to operate all the time. It's very expensive to go and kind of shut down or back off a nuclear reactor and get it back online. And so they worried about a world though, in which you know solar and wind begin to displace nuclear, they're, at, they're asked to back off. So imagine that world in which the company that owned those nuclear reactors sell strips of power via maybe a contractual mechanism, like a virtual PPA. Then you locate the electrolyzers in a distributed fashion. You make that hydrogen locally. You eliminate all that hydrogen transportation question, and you're solving the green energy via contractual vehicles. So there's interesting things like that as well that people are thinking through. Is it fair to say then, uh, Mark, that... There are technical challenges. As you say, there's going to have to be a fair amount of innovation to overcome them. But business models are are emerging. Uh, the electrolyzer technology itself, uh, models like technology like you folks have, is coming to the point where it's becoming economic. And you can foresee a business case for hydrogen that works, uh, at least, you know, for maybe heavy industry and maybe some transportation but you can see where this the trends are going in the in the right direction so it's economic and feasible and and practical absolutely mark three things that have to happen at the same time they have to be aligned one is the regulatory structure what are you allowed to do what if any incentives exist that has to exist then you've got the technology can i do this thing efficiently can i do it safely um you know how can i overcome barriers and get to scale and the third thing is business model um, you know, how do you how do you set businesses up such that it makes sense for people to invest in transportation, it makes sense to invest in small modular nuclear or grid scale solar and makes sense to invest in electrolyzers. When those three things are aligned, that's when the market moves. Mark, it's been fascinating. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure.